Oh Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall declare your praise. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. and our life. Oh, come, let us worship Him. Please come and have a seat. I, I abbreviated a, a few verses, or I didn't abbreviate, I, I left out a few verses in between. Because um, for those of you who were in first service, if you heard uh, the sermon, if I kept you awake for the sermon, you probably recognize these two things. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. And the last verse, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Uh, I think those two verses sum up uh, our relationship to God. And, you know, whenever I think about anxiety, uh, I remember, uh, I think I was high school or college age, I, 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 don't quote me on that, I, I don't know, it was one of those two. <laughs> and um, there was a commercial on television during the football games from Prudential, where this guy is putting up a shelf and it falls down and creates a mess, and as he's cleaning up, you know, he's sweeping and cleaning up, and he says, I've got credential for the big things. I can handle the little things. And he turns around and knocks off an antique clock with the back of his broomstick, you know. And that always reminds me of, of what anxiety really is for the Christian. We think we can clean up our own mess. We really do. And the reality is, <laughs> we can't. And so, yeah, I've got God for the big things in life, and I'll handle the little, the little things. things. Yeah. <laughs> Which is, uh, uh, and by the way, I got that term maybe, maybe from Ken Corby too, or else it, maybe his chief disciple, which was um, um, one of his chief disciples, he had many, uh, Bill Swirla, some of you probably oh, know Bill Swirla. Um, who, who um, uh, gave us that expression about, I can handle the little things, you know, uh, we need God for the big things. So, we pray together, Almighty and merciful God, it is by your grace that we live as your people who offer acceptable service. Grant that we may walk by faith and not by sight, in the way that leads to eternal life, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Taught by our Lord and trusting his promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit bless and preserve you. Amen. Okay, moving on. Look how cute those couple is. Pardon? Isn't that a cute couple? Oh, yeah, yeah aren't they? <laughs> so handsome. Yeah, one out of two isn't bad. <laughs> Okay, 
First John five. One. I start First John five verse sixteen. We've been on this for a while, but I, I think it's worth us viewing again. I just wanted to talk a little bit uh, later, if we have time at the end. Hopefully we'll conclude today, because Pastor Meyer will be on for the next few weeks. Uh, if anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he will ask and God will give him life. What is that really telling us? <coughs> Parse out the term brother, first of all. What is a brother? Neighbor? A fellow Christian? Me. Biblically speaking, most often it means a fellow Christian. The brotherhood of man is not a concept foreign to scripture, but that term is never used in that context. Brother is almost always one who same says the faith with you. Okay? So, um, the Apostle Paul says it this way in, in Galatians 6. As we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those, and here it comes, who are the household of faith. <laughs> okay, so uh, Paul would have said that to Holy Cross Lutheran congregation. Um, in, in other words, that's the household of faith. The people that gather together to receive God's gifts. Um, and in that context, um, we are to take special care one for another in the following ways. We are not to lay stumbling blocks in front of the weak. Um, you can read uh, Paul's letters to the Corinthians and others to, to go through that. But basically, uh, the question of, of food offered to idols. Can we eat it? Is it unclean? Because it was intended for an idol. Well, Paul said, look, we know there are no idols. There's only one true God. No big deal. But if it offends your neighbor, be careful. If, if the one with the weak conscience is offended by your activity, don't do it. And this is what I was trying to express <laughs> last week. And somebody asked me what I really meant by that. So let me see if I can clarify I was talking about the time a recovering alcoholic had come to visit me and tell me he was recovering. And he was doing just fine, thank you. And life is really wonderful and, and you know, he's on the road to sobriety and, you know, great. Then he said something to this effect, real Christians never drink. <laughs> now I had no thought about pouring a glass of wine until he said that. And then I went out in the kitchen, got two glasses of wine, one for my uh, glasses, one for my wife, one for me, and poured us each one, put the bottle away, I'm not going to put it in front of him. And he, he, he kind of got upset at me, I can't understand why. <laughs> my object lesson didn't, didn't ring straight with him. But the good news is, three weeks later he came back and said, okay, I get what you were trying to say. He got it. You know. We cannot let people put burdens upon us. And Paul says that. Do not let yourself be yoked again to the slavery of the law. Don't do it. Real Christians never, real Christians always. When I hear those words, my pastoral ears prick up and my pastoral antenna is going like this. I mean, big time. I know something's coming that isn't, that's heretical at best. And, uh, maybe even worse than that. So we have to really be careful about, about these two things. We don't, do not want to give offense by our words or our deeds, but by the same token, we cannot allow people to bind us to a law which is not of God. OK? 
Okay. Now, there, there is, you can argue whether it's good for your health and all that kind of thing. And by the way, I would put cigar and cigarette smoking in that category too. Um, God does not expressly forbid that activity. But overeating is just as bad as smoking and killing yourself with lung cancer. I mean, I, I get that. And, and so, but we cannot say that's sin. You're a big sinner because you you smoke, and if you if you'd stop smoking, then you you'd be you'd be more faithful. That's not biblical at all. And and so we have to really step with caution in this field. So again, we want to assist the brother, especially the weaker brother but we don't want to offend. Here's my question for you. Does God put the strong Christian with the weak Christian, or the weak Christian with the strong Christian? Yes. 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 <laughs> you found me out. <laughs> and that's really true. And, and, and by the way, the weak Christian can teach the strong Christian humility, compassion and a few other things that we could talk about. And the strong Christian can be there for spiritual support. Okay. What defines a strong Christian? God. No, uh, look, saving faith is saving faith, right? It, uh, this is a bad illustration, but it's the best one I can come up with. Having faith in Christ is like being pregnant. It's not something you do on your own. Okay? Now, sometimes people are pregnant, and they don't even know it. Would you agree with that? Yes. Sometimes people are pregnant, and we all know it. Would you agree with that? Yes. I remember... <laughs> when I was a little kid, we had a neighbor, and uh, I was good friends with, with her son. We were about the same age. And um, all of a sudden, one Sunday morning, she's not in church. She was quite heavy set. And we found out she'd been pregnant, and she'd given birth to a child. And it was on Easter Sunday. That's why I remember it, the 22nd of March. That doesn't happen very often. Um, and, and I remember my, my parents on didn't even know she was pregnant, and they weren't the only ones, you know. Th that's what we need to be cautious about regarding faith. We can't discern whether someone has faith or not. It's not our call. If they say, I don't believe any of this stuff, that's the sin against the Holy Spirit. Okay? Uh, it could be. could be. Um, I have to be careful with that one, too. <laughs> um, because that too can be repented. But if you say, I, I will get that Holy Spirit out of here, I'm not going to listen to anything that's biblical, etc., etc., that's coming very close to, to drawing the line in the sand. Um, and so, as a child of God, we have to operate in the Heather. So, to answer that question, I, I really have no idea. Strong faith. I know at times my faith is very strong. I know when the airline loses my luggage, my faith is kind of weak. And the airline? Or God? Yes. <laughs> Why? Because I become anxious about it. See, rather than giving it to God. And I was saying to some who were here before, plus, it was very interesting to me because when when I finally, during the night, decided I didn't have to worry about this, God had already taken care of it, and said, okay, Lord, you're in charge here. I didn't go to sleep, but at least I relaxed. You know, I, I said, okay, and the Lord gave me the thought, yeah, okay, I'll send Jan on ahead, and I'll go and get the bag, and I probably won't make that flight, but that's the way life is. At least we'll have our bag, and I'll get there however I get there. And that's 
that Jan woke up with the same thought. She wasn't asleep either, so I shouldn't say she woke up. Um, <laughs> that was that was a very uh, we we could have saved the airlines two hundred eighty nine dollars or something like that if we wouldn't have gone to the hotel that night because we didn't sleep anyway, you know. Uh, yeah, and it's the way life is. So uh, anxiety. Yes. If it's time, how, how can there be a sin that does not lead to death? Because I thought all sin leads to death. All a sin of ignorance? For example, when, when, um, when someone other than Phil, who's a member of this congregation, sins against you, and they don't even know it, what do you do? If it bothers you, then you have to talk to them. But otherwise... Because they're ignorant of it, okay. and so um, and and uh, slights and whatever. I I have a I have a single track mind, and if I'm thinking about something, you know, please don't interrupt me because I'll I'll forget what I was thinking about, and I'll never understand what you're trying to say to me because I'm trying to remember what I was trying to think about. <laughs> so especially now. Um, so, I can literally walk right past people and not see them standing there. And, and for some, some church members, they take that as a slight. And man, I'm as guilty as sin. But I didn't even know it. I mean, it, it was my issue. Um, that, I think, is the kind of thing we're talking about. Okay. The thing that leads to death is despising the Holy Spirit. And as Mr. Felix rightly gave me that askance look when I said what I said a couple minutes ago um, about the sin against the Holy Spirit, we have to be very, very careful about that one. Um, unless somebody tells me I don't believe any of this stuff, you know, the Holy Spirit has no power over me, you know, then, then I'm going to have to treat him as an impenitent person. But once, once that person says, no, I'm not going there, then we have to move on to excommunication. Because to give him the body and blood of Christ is to work judgment against him. Can't do that. Can't do that. So, sins of weakness, um, doubts, despair, and if anyone in this room tells me you haven't been there, uh, I'm going to look at you kind of funny. Um, that's who we are. That comes with our old nature that still comes to us. Dennis. Um, a little bit of confusion in he shall ask and God will give him life. Keep going. To those who commit sins that do not lead to death. Okay? So, I, I think here again, Death is being used in this case as spiritual death. Okay, the way we all came into this world, we were by nature spiritually blind, dead, and enemies of God. And the Holy Spirit changes that to give us life um, uh, through the power of Christ by reconnecting us. So, there is a sin that leads to death. I do not say that one should pray for that. If someone has committed a sin that leads to death, um, you know, that's, that's theirs. Um, as, as parents of children who sometimes, <coughs> and grandchildren who wander and stray like little lost lambs, let us say, who have been baptized, but maybe have forgotten their baptism, uh, those we pray for. Oh, those we pray for. Um, and please, parents and grandparents like me, you, you know, we need to pray for them because no one else is going to. Um, so, so please continue to do that. Um, th this is the key. All wrongdoing is sin. But here again, I would like to back up to Renee's question and say, sometimes we're not aware that we've sinned. That's why we say, 
uh, of things that, that I know and things that I don't know that I've done. You know, in the confession of sins. Of those things that I'm aware and those that I'm not aware. Um, our Lutheran confessions say, no one can enumerate all their sins. And, um, you know, I, I remember, I think it was Dr. Corby who taught me this, that sometimes people think they have to confess every sin or they're going to hell. And, and, and even the sins they're unaware of. Well, how can you confess what you don't know you've done? You know, if you don't know it's sin, how can you confess it? Um, that was Luther's struggle. If you, if you remember, you know, it's flat self-flagellation, beating himself for things that he imagined, uh, you know, because he knew that deep in him was the old Adam. He knew that. Um, and and uh, here again, I think we just have to uh, let God be God. And we don't need to draw up, draw out people's sins uh, whatever. And um, I, I remember uh, Dr. Corby saying he was hearing confession from someone who, who, like Mary, was a former Roman Catholic and said, I, 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 I cursed four times last week. Oh shit, no, five, six! <laughs> um, something like that, you know, and, and that, that's the point. We have used words incorrectly. That's our sin. We have, we have misused God's great gift of language and speech and communication. That's what we did in the confessional. <laughs> Except you didn't say the, the, the part with oh. <laughs> okay. Uh, but, but again, all wrongdoing is sin. We're not overlooking sin here. We're not saying uh, if you commit a sin that doesn't lead to death, it's okay. You don't have to worry about it. No. If you know about it, you confess it. You repent of it. Um, <laughs> sometimes you find out that, that you committed a sin against someone you weren't even aware of. Well, ask for their forgiveness and move on. You know, um, that's what the body does. Um, when, it's, when it's working right, uh, it, it's like our immune system. When it's not working right, it's like cancer. Sin destroys us from within. It eats ourselves alive. It rips away our security of salvation. Mary. When we say the Our Father, isn't that us confessing to God that we maybe sinned and we didn't know about it? Mm, could be. It depends on who's praying. I suppose, you know. Um, as, as the Catechism says, before God we should plead guilty of all sins, even those we don't know about. But before our confessor or our fellow Christian, we plead guilty only of those sins which we know in our heart, which we recognize. Um, I would say, the benefit of going to a pastor or priest to make confession is that if they're doing their job right, they're going to push you a little bit so that you examine yourself and see what's really there. Not, thank God I'm not like other people. So, you know, because I, um, just to give some examples, uh, I will twist them a little bit because a pastor never reveals what has been confessed to him in the confessional. But I, I remember one of my parishioners coming in and saying, oh, pastor, I, please forgive me. I've gotten so angry at my mother this week. And I thought, well, that's a good start. Yeah. But if you knew what she was like, you would understand. <laughs> Bummer. Now, now I had to become the surgeon, the doctor, you know, who picked at that sore. No, no, we're not. Finally, I had to say, we're not talking about your mother. We're talking about your sin. Um, and get us back where we need it to be. We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning. 
So all those sins that you've done and repented of, you've never repeated? <laughs> That's not what this is saying either. But he who was born of God protects him. So the Holy Spirit is caring for us. Uh, and the evil one does not touch him. So we have the Son and the Spirit fighting for us every moment and day of our lives. And we know that we are from God. Is that confidence? I think so. Pretty clear. And the whole world lies, oh, that's the next statement, whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Someone translate that for me. Satan owns them. What? Uh, the earth is the devil's kingdom. Where he rules. That the devil's always trying to be after us, and it doesn't matter. <coughs> He's always constantly there trying to make us fall. Who who is who the, is in in charge of heaven and earth? God. Be more specific, please. I think it means that we, we tend to live in our sin, so we tend to live um, not in the world, but of the world. So we take on all these sinful notions and ideas and things <coughs> that happen in our world that we then tend to say is, well, it's just normal. Okay, catechism time. The devil. The <laughs> world. The world. Our own sinful flesh. And our own flesh. Those are our enemies. Has Christ defeated them? Yes. yes. So how can the devil be running the world? Can he tempt us if we lie in the power? Because we would be asked to be led not into temptation. He tempts those who are not believers. <laughs> Andy, you had your hand up. Well, the Lord's ago. Spirit says, the kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So... Uh, That's what we pray for, isn't that it? That muddies things up. Uh, yeah. For me, it muddies things up. Yeah. <laughs> and, and Earth, of course, is not... Um, it, it oftentimes appears to our eyes to be the devil's domain. But if you really believe in the resurrection, then the power of Satan has been crushed. <coughs> Pardon? This, this sentence here? You know that we're from God. No, it says the world. The world lies in the power of the evil. <coughs> the evil one is always going to be working in the world to draw one away from Christ to whatever. The lottery. Um, you name it. He's going to be there doing it. And so the devil, the world, and our own flesh are always our enemies. But Christ is our champion. He has crushed Satan's head. He will bruise your heel, and you will crush his head. Okay? That's the, that's the promise to Satan. And wh where did that take place? You confessed it in the creed today. He descended into hell. Why did Christ descend into hell? Certainly not to suffer. Claim victory. Claim victory. Claim is victory. Yeah. And, and here again, there are uh, Colossians 2 um, uh, is one passage, and there's a couple more that talk about Christ's descent into hell. But they're rather few and far between. Why is that? You'll have to ask God. I didn't, I, I'm not in charge of the scriptures. <laughs> um, what, what I will say is this, that um, we need to take Satan and his power seriously. He has been defeated. But um, Luther used to say, 
Uh, Satan is like a mad dog on a chain. <laughs> He, 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 he's trying to kill you. But on that chain, the other end of that chain is Jesus, Jesus who is his master. We sing that, um, own your own master. Uh, that's, that's a line in one of our hymns. I can't think of which one it is. Where's our musicians right now? Okay. Somebody <laughs> help me out here. Um, I just can't remember. No pressure. <laughs> Allison would know. Yeah. Roll out God's thunder. What's that hymn? Oh. Jesus has come and bring <laughs> pleasure to yeah. eternal. That's the one. Thank you, Marion. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, that Satan has been defeated. Now, in Revelation, what do we know about Satan? At the end times, the chain is going to be removed for a little while. And this particular theologian believes that we might be living in that time now. I think Luther said exactly the same thing in his video. <laughs> so I, I can't say you know, but, and I think it's important for us to recognize that Satan cannot stand up when we are there with our big brother. But when we take him on by ourselves, we're, we're in for a, a bad, bad time. And we intend, we attempt to do that. And uh, one way we attempt to do it is by, by not allowing the Word of God to have free course in our lives by not attending Bible class. Well, I learned that in confirmation in 1947. <laughs> Need anything new? Uh, maybe not. Um, and, and that kind of thing leads, leaves us unprepared for the attacks of Satan. And as I said last week, Satan knows your weaknesses better than you do. Jerome, he knows yours better than even your wife does. And she knows them pretty well, I'm thinking by now. I think my wife does anyway. Okay, my, my weaknesses. Not yours. <laughs> uh, so, um, and Satan knows them better than any of us. And he's going to see to it that if our weakness is um, for uh, the, beautiful, the beauty of God's creation in the other person, um, that, you know, everyone around us is beautiful, or whatever the case may be. You know, Satan does, that's how he works. Uh, always laying before us temptation after temptation after temptation. And... Um, uh, as I mentioned, I think as we get older, the Christian uh, temptation tends to be, in our older age, of uh, maybe a bit of spiritual arrogance. You know, thank God I've made it through. Uh, the majority of my children are still Christian. You know, um, I've got a, a, two doctors and one nurse. Yeah, you're absolutely right. You know, patting ourselves on the back. And, and that's, that's maybe not the way we should be operating. So, when we say the whole world lies in the power of the evil, they're all open to his temptation. And he's busy. Very, very busy. And we know that the Son of God and has, give, has come and has given us understanding. What is the understanding he's given us? Barbara. I don't know if that is the understanding he gives us, but nobody is exempt from the evil one. There, we're all susceptible to falling into lies and. Yeah, how, how do you fight that? Prayer. Come on, Jesus. How about let us ever walk with Jesus, huh? Yeah. Um, the reason I say it that way is because. 
prayer sometimes people think is our activity. And they stop on that end. That's not going to get it done. I like your answer better. What, what, <laughs> thank you. What, 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 what I'm going to suggest is that um, prayer is part of it. Of course it is. But, but prayer is our conversation with God. Our requesting of God to bring us the assurance that Christ's death and resurrection has defeated the evil one. His dem temptations have been defeated and I don't have to succumb to them because my Savior is not only for me, but in me. Okay? And um, that's the understanding I think he's laying out for us here. John. Howard. Yeah, this brings to mind Christ in the Old Testament with David and Goliath. Goliath is a type of the devil, and he was going to kill them, make slaves of them, and he blasphemed God, and David crushed his head with a little stone. And That's interesting. And I've never heard anyone talk about that as a type before. Yeah, and David is I a should type maybe of consider a that. Pre-incarnate Christ. Well, uh, be careful with that. <laughs> That's the angel of the Lord, the pre-incarnate Christ. He is what the He's ancestor, David's son. David's son. Right. He points to Christ. No, he yeah. Put a youth. Absolutely. Yeah, and and he, he as Deacon says, he points us to Christ. Right. He's the arrow, but um, don't use pre-incarnate Christ. That doesn't fit there. Okay. All right. See, I'm, I'm really crotchety in my old age. I'm, I'm trying to parse things out so we don't get confused. And we are in Him. Now, if I were writing this, that'd be a capital H on that hymn. Who is true in His Son, Jesus Christ. So this is God the Father. We are in Him. Um, Lazarus in Abram's bosom, we are really in the bosom of the Father. Placed there by the Son. Brought there by the work of the Son. And um, God the Father is the true God and eternal life. But God is not just Father. He is Son and Spirit as well. And that is why we can talk about Him as true God and eternal life. Here's the last sentence in 1 John 5. <laughs> Little children, keep yourselves from idols. What is an idol? Well, uh, anything I'm anxious about. <laughs> <laughs> He's setting you, you second service people up for the sermon. Thank you, Walt. Uh, you, you get uh, two cents for that Good. contribution. Um, yeah, what else? What is an idol? Anything that's more important to you than God. Yeah. Anything that gets in between the true God and us. What are some common idols? Cookies. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> this thing. Yeah, that's really A nice bottle of red. Well, L Luther used to explain it this way. There, there are gross idols and fine idolatry. He used that term gross, meaning blatant. And, and, uh, and I use the term subtle. So we have blatant idols and subtle idols. Um, I remember when I was a young child going to a mission festival in the days when we had mission festivals at fairgrounds and uh, 15,000 people would show up at, at uh, Garden City, um, which was the Garden City, Minnesota, which was uh, had the fairgrounds, and we would all sit around in the fairgrounds and, and listen to some Lutheran speaker or something like that. And I, I, I remember them talking about, uh, we had a, a missionary one time from India who was talking about people bowing down to animals, like cows and so forth, as their ancestors. That, most of us would call a gross idol, right? Um, Dennis just showed us a gross idol. Right, Heather? 
No, I think it's a resource. So okay. I think there's a subtle title of pride. <laughs> No, no, I, I, thank you, Andy, I'll come in a minute. Um, so, gross idols are things that we readily identify as being an idol. We, we can see it's between us and God. It can be a family member, you know, uh, well, um, I don't want to say you're going to hell because, you know, da, da, da. It can be a spouse, it can be a lot of things, okay? That can be a gross idol that we put before God. Um, you know, the first commandment, the way I learned it in the old King James, you shall have no other gods before me. Right? Before. But what's the literal translation of the Hebrew? In my face. You shall have no gods in my, literally, in my sea. Interesting. Okay? So, in my face. Uh, yeah, I think that's a little bit more clarifying than before me. Before me sounds like, okay, I've got a few other gods, but they're under the true God. He's number one, but they're down the list someplace. Yeah, yeah. As long as they're after and not before. Yeah, I, I had a student quiz me about that one day, and I had to think that through. Um, so, fine idols are the ones that like anything else, uh, in, in Luther's day, the printing press, the movable type printing press, was an absolute marvel in that it, it got gospel and hymns and Luther's rights. Do you realize at one time, uh, I forget what the percentage, I think 25% of all printed books were written by Martin Luther? <laughs> think about that. Now, he was an idol, I-D-L-E, but books can become our idols. Uh, the printing press can, you know, that same printing press printed pornography. Um, Advertisements. Yeah, that, that, that <laughs> phone that is a resource can take away our time. That's true, I'm looking up the hymnal right now. Yeah, see? Uh, all those kind of things. And, and so, the, those subtle idols are more difficult for us to see, but maybe even more dangerous mm -hmm. than the coarse ones. Andy first, and then Helen. I would say the most common idol is wearing our shoes. <laughs> what? Wearing what? Me, myself, and I, the unholy yeah. trinity. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, yeah uh, I. I'm reading a book right now which is really a challenge for me in many ways. It's talking about uh, idolatry, but it's talking about the self, how self has become God. And I say it's difficult because not only is it uh, like reading Einstein's theory of relativity, um, but I have to stop and take out my phone and look up words as I'm reading it. Because I don't have the foggiest idea what the what the guy's saying by these words. Uh, there was a term, M E I N I C. I have no idea what that is. Minic. Something like that, or maybe it's M E N I C. I don't remember. And he was using it and expressing something as opposed to something else. And I had no idea what either of those terms meant. So. It, that's why I say it's a struggle for me, but um, I, I hope to conquer it uh, on the plane to Kenya at least. <laughs> Who knows? But we'll see. Um, Are you talking about E equals MC squared? No, no, that's Einstein. <laughs> <laughs> Even I can say that hard. I don't understand it, but I can say it. Um, it's like the guy who was teaching Einstein's theory of relativity in college, and he looked up at his class and they're all just blank faces. So he went to the board, he diagrammed and he did it again, and turned around, still blank faces. Did it one more time and he said, that time I understood it. <laughs> um, which is kind of like what pastors do sometimes. Oh yeah, that's how that works <laughs> as we go along. See, Andy and then Helen. Oh, I was just gonna make a comment about, I, it's one of the issues I had um, in leading the Catholic Church 
um, was the worship of the saints. And uh, I, I just started to question it in my own mind. I had bigger issues, but that was one of them. So is that a fine idol? Because I once had a cousin. I, I, you have to understand, my grandparents had 58 grandchildren, and this was a huge Roman Catholic family. So all my aunts and uncles were very devout as far as going to confession on Saturday and mass on Sunday. Did they did they have say Christopher in the I, front yeah of their we car? had those all hanging in our cars. Okay. But the one that got me the most is I was trying to sell a house because I had bought another one and I needed to sell my house really bad. Mm -hmm. And my cousin, yes, her heart brought over a statue of Saint Joseph. And buried yep. it upside down. And buried down. it upside yep. down to help yep. sell my house. Yep. Why is that? And it's old. So is that a fine no well it eventually did I, I would <laughs> say I would say that would be a gross item. <laughs> Uh, that's why not is that subtle. supposed to work? I, know. That's not I don't subtle. know why upside down. I have yeah. no idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, when, when we talk about saints, it is, it is fine for us to learn from them, to, to remember their faithfulness, especially martyrs, um, and to honor them for being faithful examples. Okay? Um, but to pray, to directly. to bury them upside down or right side up or whatever, <laughs> no, that's that that that's idolatry. But you have it in the Catholic Church as kids, at least. I don't know how it is now. I've not been to the Catholic, I've been a Lutheran now way longer than I was a Catholic. I left the Catholic Church at about age twenty-six. So we're not going to inquire how many years. <laughs> <or so. laughs> many years and. Um, now I lost my train of thought. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to my club. <laughs> okay. Um, any other comments, questions, thoughts about idols? I don't have it about idols, but sometimes I go through this and I think, you know, that's the Lord's Prayer right there through this, that the will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. And then how do we end it? For thine is the the kingdom and the power. glory, and it's all there. The dots all there. Good point, Jane. Yeah. Thank you, Mrs. Froll. Again, you have spotted the head of, of the nail and hit oh. it fine. <laughs> <laughs> any any other comments or questions? Let me give you a little brief preview. Uh, next week, uh, Mrs. Froll and I will be down Southern California um, next Sunday. Pastor Meyer will have Bible class for the next several weeks. Um, then in September um, 6th, Mrs. Furl and I are leaving for Kenya. Um, so I'll pray for Pastor Meyer that his voice stays strong and he stays strong and Barb stays strong. And everybody stays strong because Barb's taking Mrs. Furl's Bible class while she's gone. Um, Rick Felix will be taking um, the Thursday, Thursday Bible class. Uh, while I'm away, I'll have the first session and then he will be taking at least two while well, I'm gone, probably three. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, we're, yeah, and then there'll be a call committee. Do you have any idea when a meeting will be? When the call? Yeah. Uh, no, just a, a call meeting. I was going to say, yeah, no. No, okay. So the call committee will be meeting, and um, then they will tell us when we will be meeting. Or, or if we will uh, be meeting. I, I, it, it, won't, it won't probably be before the 21st. Okay. Uh, it may be the 21st, probably more likely the 28th. Okay. Of which month? The congregational meeting, right? Mm -hmm. 28th of August or uh, September? We don't know yet. Uh, let's go with August because that's a Sunday. Yeah. <laughs> and, and again, nothing's in writing. You guys are asking me a question. I'm trying to give you some idea of what's happening. We. We, have, we don't have the answer to that because that answer is actually outside of the purview currently of the call committee. The call committee continues to meet. We're meeting again this week, but last week, but the week before that. So we continue to meet. Uh, a lot of this will become clearer when we have that congregational meeting. Thank you. I didn't mean to put you in the spot, Mr. Chairman, but hey, better you than me. That's my motto. <laughs> um, so, uh, 
when it when it comes my turn to be back on Bible studies, um, I think we're going to go to second job, and then third job, um, because I can remember those things, and uh, uh, I don't have to uh, I don't have to have my crib sheet in front of me all, all the time for second job and third job uh, to remember what we're doing. So, um, any questions or comments? Uh, final comments, uh, Bart. When it comes to the temptation of the devil, one thing that gives me great comfort is it will not be snatched from the hand of the Lord. Yes. That verse just... Yeah. And no one shall snatch them out of my Father's hand. Yeah. You know? Like a little child is kidnapped. You know, that, that that's, that's good language. It, it really tells us how vulnerable we are. Um, and that's why we should always be holding on to the hand of the big guy, you know, uh, of our Lord and Savior. Uh, thank you for your <coughs> kindness and patience during this time. We adjourn with the apostolic benediction. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much.